Okay, ma'am. So, good afternoon. Uh, I think, uh, Dr. Paras, a few words from you. Then we will just go. You should tell about the EDPA or a little bit of thing. One minute. Or we yeah. shall go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ruby, for organizing this session with Dr. Ganga Khedkar. He is a renowned virologist. And we are happy at EDPA to associate with him at many number of occasions. We have been trained by him for all the viral insults that we are facing one after another. And uh, we feel privileged to welcome him at EDPA. And EDPA has uh, many roles to play. One of the role is discussion of knowledge and education about whatsoever is currently on uh, with respect to its practical aspects. And we are happy to have our seniors like Dr. Grover, sir, Dr. S.K. Gupta, our colleagues, Rajiv Bansal, who is our scientific chairperson, Dr. Pankaj, who is our uh, chairperson for the medical education. So we have many portfolios and we have many people taking care of it. And Swati Jami is our new dynamic secretary who has attained this role and status to organize things very quickly. And we feel blessed to have you also with us. Uh, taking and spearheading all the educative components of EDP. So with that, I welcome everybody on board. And uh, Ruby, you take charge of that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Paras. Uh, thank you. We have uh, today's session. As we know, the monkeypox, this is a new threat uh, to the mankind. And uh, I mean, for this talk, uh, India is having the eight cases so far reported. Three in the Delhi, one death in the Kerala. Uh, I think uh, the sir is the best person to enlighten us. We have the, our chairpersons. Dr. Ashok Grover is a very senior physician of the East Delhi. Uh, he is a senior consultant, internal medicine, Max Hospital, Vaishali, uh, Pushpanli Medical Center. Sir has his own clinic uh, and uh, since long, he is an internal medicine person in the East Delhi. We have Dr. S.K. Gupta. Sir, with us as a, a chairperson, Dr. S.K. Gupta is also a very senior physician, senior internal medicine person in East Delhi. And he has uh, done a lot of work in the COVID. I mean, he has just, uh, his book is also been launched uh, uh, on the COVID uh, after this uh, COVID epidemic. And COVID epidemic is still with us. We have uh, Dr. Pankaj Chaudhary with us. Dr. Pankaj is also senior uh, physician, senior internal medicine person. He is associated with the Max uh, Hospital Vaishali. And uh, he, uh, uh, I mean, all the West uh, Ghaziabad. So we have the good uh, uh, panel for the discussion. Uh, I will request Dr. Grover, sir, just to introduce uh, Dr. Ganda, sir. And after that, we can take the comments from Dr. S.K. Gupta, sir, or Dr. Pankaj Chaudhary. So I don't want to waste time. Grover, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ruby. I think it is a proud privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Raman Ganga Khedkar. I think we all know him uh, so well because he has been with us uh, in the COVID era. But nevertheless, there are many new members also who are part of this uh, uh, evening uh, uh, you know, talk. And uh, just to say a few words about uh, the Padma Shri Awardee uh, in 2020, Dr. Raman Ganga Khedkar, uh, he is uh, at present uh, the Dr. C.G. Pandit National Chair, ICMR. And he's also the former head uh, division of the Epidemi Epidemiology and Communicable Diseases, ICMR, and uh, director in charge the National AIDS uh, Research Institute, Pune. And he has, uh, as the head of the ECD, managed research and contributed to public health responses in recent outbreaks of Nipah, Zika, and COVID-19. And also, he is a member of the National Task Force of COVID-19. He is also a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of ICMR, a member of the governing body of the Institute of Medical Sciences, BHU, Varanasi, and NI, uh, National Institute of Tuberculosis and Respiratory Diseases, New Delhi. And he has many portfolios to, to his credit and has also been working in the field of HIV for nearly over three decades. He has more than 220 publications to his credit and also has published Sir, five books on HIV inf infection. Sir, 
So these are uh, some of his uh, uh, achievements uh, uh, before you. And I uh, request uh, Dr. Ruby to take the session forward and invite Dr. Ganga Khedkar for the talk. Yeah, Doctor. Uh, I think before Dr. Ganga Khedkar, uh, Dr. S. P. Gupta sir or Dr. Pakka Chaudhary, if any quick comments, uh, uh, what is uh, like uh, if we want and Doctor and Dr. Rajiv Bansal also. Yeah, where well, Dr. Rajiv yeah. Bansal is? Uh, I am not seeing him. Dr. Rajiv Bansal. Sir, are you here? Yeah, 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 yeah sir, you are our scientific uh, chair, and uh, thank you very much for organizing this session. And uh, Jinda, thing, I think, uh, Rudy, uh, few words from I you. I would uh, like to say about Professor uh, Raman. He was the first person who had the courage to inform the government of India about the first case of COVID being detected in India, and not many people in the country, even the uh, people sitting, sitting on the top posts of ICMR and in many other places had the courage to give this information and this, uh, this responsibility was handed over to him and he was, uh, he carried on further with the COVID and we learned a lot from him. I think without wasting much time, I would request uh, Dr. Ruby to kindly invite Professor Ganga Ketkar to start today's proceedings. Yeah, before that, uh, Dr. Rajiv Bansal, sir, please, just... Uh... I think it's a proud privilege for EDPA to have a, such a, you know, a wonderful speaker of international repute. So without wasting time, I think everyone is waiting to listen to him. And after he finishes his talk, then we can open the discussion. Yes. You know? So please, I welcome uh, Dr. Gangri for the talk. Yes, sir. So Dr. Ganga, sir. Uh, yes. Just uh, I uh, we hand over the platform to you, and we are. Now uh, <clears throat> today I have uh, Eustachian tube block. Is my voice audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I need to <laughs> I need to ask once. <laughs> Now, today, what we are going to do is discuss issues around monkeypox. Is it going to be a really new threat? No. Uh, what kind of uh, research has been done so far? And what are the gaps in knowledge that we need to understand today? So when you think in terms of monkeypox virus, as we generally have an abbreviation, NPXV, it's a double standard DNA virus that belongs to the same family as that of smallpox. This is a brick-shaped envelope virus of a size of about 200 to 250 nanometers. Now, human monkeypox infection is generally, you know, we used to think that it's a zoonotic infection. We did not know that it has a potential for human-to-human -to -human transmission, which we will try and understand later. Smallpox, cowpox, buffalopox, Vaccinia virus. These are Hello. Can can everyone mute? Now, if you look at monkeypox virus, it has three different clades. The first clade was seen in Congo, which was more virulent. The clade two, which is seen in West Africa, is the one that we have we have been reported to have in India as of now, and clade three is one that we are seeing in Europe uh, at this point in time. Now, when we think in terms of monkeypox, when was it detected? The first case cases of monkeypox among animals were detected in Denmark in 1958. Now, everything has some connotation. No? When I write that it is macaca mulata and macaca uh, fascicularis, we have to understand that these are the monkeys which are commonly seen even in India. Now, that's something which we have, to, we have to remember. These were lab animals. There were studies to be done with respect to polio in Singapore. But when they were sent to Denmark, they were found to have uh, these lesions from where the monkeypox was detected, the virus was detected then. And that's why it was named as monkeypox. The first reports of monkeypox causing illness in human beings actually came from Congo in 1970. This one, this particular infection has been endemic since then in Congo, Nigeria, and certain certain countries in Central and West African uh, areas. Now, interestingly, the number of cases that were reported 
1970 to 2080 were small in numbers you know the reported cases were less than 100 but that doesn't mean those numbers could be reliable because it is possible that either the reports were not being made or the healthcare infrastructure that was available was not picking up those infections but suddenly the numbers jumped up after 2005 and that jumped up by almost close to 20 times now can this entire thing you know if you look at what has happened in 1970 and 2000 one of the things that has happened was smallpox vaccination was stopped now smallpox all of us know you vaccine used to provide us a cross protection against other pox viruses especially even monkey pox virus per se now can this be attributed to discontinuation of smallpox vaccination possibly yes because of the cross protection that it tends to provide which essentially means that we should be expecting even pox viruses of different kind that can jump from animals to human beings also as a threat that might come subsequently because smallpox vaccination is currently discontinued the biggest jump in numbers that has been observed was in 2022 in may 2022 the entire process started and current number is over 23000 cases uh, in the world and 70 of these uh, countries which are reporting this infection are actually non endemic countries now what could be the reason for such a rapid spillover because if from 1970 to almost 50 years the infection did not spread as rapidly elsewhere though there were sporadic reports you know that once there was an outbreak that was found in us you know there were small outbreaks that occurred uh, even in europe but the kind of spillover that we are seeing is definitely little different now why could this have had happened you know the initial phases perhaps had only animal to human spread and that used to occur through bush meat either consumption or touching the uh, dead animals through which people were exposed to it now one of the things which we have to remember is bush meat uh, if you actually look at some of the data that was emerging you know bush meat was detected among travelers who were recently going to africa in their own packages so we do not know whether it was bush meat that was taken away from africa you know for one's own consumption actually led to trans introduction of this infection strongly in europe at this juncture there is another thing which we have to remember that if you look at european outbreak that is occurring it's occurring mostly among uh, msm population men having sex with men now is that a reflection of sexual network today you know given the fact that it's a global village it is possible that earlier you know african people may not have had in having a sexual network that went right up to europe or in usa but since now it has become a global village it is possible that this sexual network has broadened and it has taken this infection from africa to other countries at this juncture now could mutations that occur in a virus be an important cause perhaps not this is a dna virus and we will see more in detail subsequently why mutation itself may not be most important cause as such now despite you know there is certain surprises there are certain things which we have to understand though we know dna viruses do not replicate as as rapidly as we saw in case of covid as an rna virus but this particular strain if you look at the uh, picture here uh, uh, the a side it tends to show you clade 1 clade 2 clade 3 and there is a clear divergence that is coming for between clade 1 and clade 2 and clade 3 per se clade 3 appears to be distant now what this means we still do not know does it mean that this virus is now trying to stabilize between human beings and it would like to establish itself really well by genetically adapting to human beings per se the european clade is a clade is clade 3 which is also known as b1 our indian clade which is which is a clade 2 is it's also known as a2 but it is less virulent <coughs>
when you look at animals and monkey pox when we if we look back into the literature you will find that monkey pox has been detected almost in 40 different animal species now of them squirrel appears to be the most important host per se uh, among all these animals mice the rodents that we have in the household the rats monkeys porcupine and even dogs they are known to be uh, reservoirs uh, known to be having known to have this particular virus uh, detected sometime uh, in the past but do we know so much about animal reservoir perhaps not but the only evidences that are coming uh, from where we can try to conclude something squirrel appears to be one of the important reservoir animal reservoirs per se but we cannot say that confidence as of now now when you have so many animal species one of the things which we have to remember that there have been few outbreaks that have occurred in zoos in the past so zoo is likely to lead to you know dissemination of this infection from animals to human beings as well that's another thing that we have to keep at the back of mind the mode of transmission in animals perhaps through as well as the the mode of transmission in animals is perhaps not well known no it is more likely to be respiratory as it appears as of now the skin lesions that the animals tend to have appear to be similar to that you see among human beings so oh, you know it may be a good news that uh, scientists would feel very happy that this particular virus can be can can infect 40 different kinds of animals so essentially it helps you to do experiments with any animal model that is available out of 40 uh, different animals but at the same time this could be a bad news for us because it may not be not be a good news for us because it can this particular virus can establish itself in animal hosts especially pets the dogs or and the rodents very easily and then it can become endemic in any given population transmission you no know, one of the evidences that came <coughs> for for the animal uh, infections you know, when it came to certain bugs carry drugs bugs which were considered as exotic bugs they were taken to us uh, by somebody you know they wanted to they wanted to have these bugs as pet bugs and one of the dogs was infected by monkey pox the one individuals were exposed to this particular uh, dog the vi- it was established that the virus that these 11 in- 11 individuals had uh, acquired was similar to that you find in the dog as well as the six individuals who were infected per se and when people looked at the exposure it was direct here the bite that the dog had uh, on this particular human beings and scratches that were that were observed by these dogs on certain human beings per se now all these all of them had skin lesions starting from the exposure site you know wherever there was a bite or a scratch and the median time to resolve these lesions was up to 12 days as such six out of them what is most interesting is six out of them had received a single dose smallpox vaccine in the past so which essentially mean that even receipt of smallpox vaccination is not fully protective because the immunity tends to wane off over a period of time uh, and that's a message that we have to keep at the back of mind Now, how is it transmitted you know, for animals to human it's a direct contact with the infected animal it's bite or scratches for human to human it is a direct contact with infected body fluids skin lesions including the scabs indirect contact through fomites it is pretty rare respiratory route it is also very rare uh, vertical transmission has also been established in only uh, one case it was confirmed and three other cases it was thought that possibly this is also due to vertical transmission so vertical transmission is also a possibility however it is rare as of now though we cannot say with that much of confidence as of at this juncture we'll see subsequently do we know the transmission efficiency 
of each of these rules? No, we still do not know. The severity of exposure is extremely difficult to estimate. And therefore, it becomes very difficult to know as to what would be the transmission efficiency of each of these routes at, at this juncture. Do we know the secondary attack rate? Secondary attack rate means if in my family I get monkeypox, what is the likelihood or what is the transmission rate to people who may be living with me? At this juncture, you know, it is reported to be about 9%, but we also need to remember, we have to have a caution in the mind that the cluster of seven cases in the family has also been reported, which essentially means we still have to understand more about the secondary attack rate. So the larger data tends to suggest about 9%. We will still have to keep updating ourselves as the evidence tends to get generated. Do we know R0 of MPXV? It is reported to be around 1.6 in current settings in uh, Europe where it is affecting MSM population predominantly, but it is far lesser in all other settings. And when we say far lesser, it may be perhaps anywhere around 0.5 to 0.7 in other settings. And what implication does it have? That's the reason why you find that you tend to get about a, an isolated case in certain pockets, but the likelihood of seeing more than one case continues to be low even at this juncture among the contacts. Do we know the viral load in different secretions? Yes, we know. No, skin lesion has the highest viral load compared to the pharyngeal region. And why is it important to remember? Because most of us, you know, when we talk of biological fluid, one of the fluids which we will be most worried about is the fluid, pharyngeal fluid itself or oral fluids per se. But the likelihood of transmission from oral fluid is likely to be very, very low. We don't need to worry as much. The situation is almost similar as we saw in HIV. HIV is also present in all bodily fluids, including saliva, but still the risk of transmission continues to be the lowest. It's a rare mode of transmission. Incubation, when it comes to incubation period, how much is the incubation period? It's between seven to 13 days. And once the rashes start appearing, you know, they, these rashes tend to last for about two to three weeks uh, after this uh, incubation, after development of fever. Typically, most of the patients will present with fever. Within three to four days of fever, they will develop rash, which is ma macular. Then it goes to become vesicle and postular. And scabs are formed within seven to 14 days. And the thrust tends to fall by that particular time. We must remember one of the distinctive features of this particular illness is lymphadenitis. Now, this is painful lymphadenitis, and that distinguishes it from smallpox, that distinguishes it from some other differential diagnosis which we will see subsequently. Pediatric population may have rashes in non-genital regions, regions, especially face and extremities, because if they are acquiring it only through direct contact, the Wherever they might touch uh, those bodily fluids to their own bodily areas, you will find that these rashes are likely to appear. Now, this is a clinical feature of the rashes, whether, whether you look at hand and foot or you look at perianal region. And that naturally leads us to different issues in terms of diagnosis as to how we will diagnose. Now, if you look at the past picture of this particular disease, you will find most of the people who are getting in Africa uh, this particular infection were more likely to be belonging to younger age groups, especially children less than 15 years of age, and then uh, uh, young adults per se. And most often, the picture used to be that they would have non-genital rash, no? rash not in the genital area, because this was mainly because the infection that they were getting was from perhaps bush meat or the dead wild, wild animals. And therefore, the picture was entirely different. But you look at the clinical picture that you are currently seeing in Europe. This is one of the largest series of patients. More than 500 odd patients have been studied in Europe. And small number of patients were also added to US. Now, if you look at the clinical features, 
95% of them had rash, 62% had fever, lymphadenopathy was seen in 56% of the people, pharyngitis, headache, myalgia, they were also pretty common among those who were found to be infected. Now, one of the things which we have to also see is which are the sites from where the swabs came out as positive. When you take those swabs from skin or anogenital lesions, you find that 97% of the swabs that were taken from there among confirmed cases were found to be positive. They took multiple swabs from different places. When it comes to throat swab, that particular proportion dropped down to only about 26%, which is also, which confirms the fact that perhaps we need not worry as much with respect to transmission that might occur through nasopharyngeal secretions per se. When it comes to the site of lesions, 73% of them had lesions in the anogenital region and face, trunks, they constituted a significant proportion. Trunk and limbs were almost around 55% and face was 25%. Whereas palms and soles, which was a common feature in African continent, that has suddenly changed to 10% proportion among those who were European patients per se. Perhaps it's a reflection of the kind of population that was getting exposed at this juncture. Now, when it comes to differential diagnosis, what should I remember? That perhaps I might confuse it with chickenpox, especially among children, herpes simplex, uh, genitalis, you know, uh, which is something which is a common, uh, which used to be a common STI earlier. These days you don't see as much. Secondary syphilis, very rare even today at this point in time. So there are reports that in MSM population, syphilis continues to be there, a bit in small proportions. But this too is something which may mimic these lesions and smallpox, which we don't need to bother at this young age. But there is one thing which we have to remember. Now, most we are currently in a phase when the numbers are small. We would like to see that we continue to do surveillance, pick up new cases. But one of the most important things that we have to remember that there was a very nice study that was done in Congo where they wanted to start a surveillance. And when they started surveillance, uh, they had about uh, close to about 2,000 odd. Now, I don't remember the complete number. But 2,000 odd uh, people were picked up. And among them, when they started looking at those who had lesions, skin lesions, they found chickenpox was confused by most and they were referred as cases of monkeypox. And if you actually look at the diagnosis that they have done, you will almost find it was 50-50 kind of uh, uh, distribution between those who were uh, 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 monkeypox positive and varicella zoster virus positive when they tested them for these viruses per se. And most often, when it came to varicella zoster, you will find that the age groups were younger, whereas the age groups for uh, monkeypox could have been both young as well as old. When you look at the sites of mucosal lesions, what do they reveal? Just look at the data that emerges from Europe. You'll find most of them are anogenital, oropharyngeal, anogenital and oral, and nasal and eyes is a small number. Now, why, why would this be important? Because this tells you perhaps it's also a reflection of sexual identity and the, and the uh, sexual practices that perhaps may have been prevalent. And that's why you are seeing such a kind of uh, distribution of mucosal lesions. Now, when they tested, all these people for STIs. You know, what was it that came as a surprise among MSM? Majority of them, you know, almost around 29% uh, at, at that point in time when they had uh, um, a monkeypox infection, they had uh, classical STIs or concomitant STIs that was present, which came as a surprise, mainly because we at least now know that you know, in presence of STI, now whenever we will estimate the transmission efficiencies, we'll have some data whether if this turns out to be an STI, whether this is going to influence the transmission efficiency dramatically as we had seen in HIV. We still don't know that part, 
that these are the people who were behaviorally vulnerable naturally they had uh, uh, they had a significant proportion that also had concomitant uh, stis and if you look at the european study you know you will find that 95% of the cases that uh, that were detected in europe as having monkeypox they were msm now 41% of them once you say msm uh, there is another risk that emerges and the risk is of being co infected with hiv 41% of them were also hiv infected now that leads to a question would it lead to worse outcomes because these are immuno suppressed individuals now if you look at their data one of the things which emerges very strongly that majority of their patients you know if you look at less than 50 copies per ml you know 95% of them they are having viral load suppressed and therefore when they say that none of their patients with monkeypox died perhaps that's an indication that even in 41% of the patients who were having hiv infection the presence of adherence to art and virologic suppression perhaps protected them from an adverse impact that could have had been otherwise seen if you look at the case fatality rate it's very very low uh, even today if you actually calculate uh, this case fatality rate it will go down to less than uh, one per 1000 but what is also important to remember that when it comes to african studies which are not uh, what would i say not uh, um, not uh, <laughs> uh, you cannot be you cannot say that those studies were very very robust but there could have been multiple biases in those studies there they have reported that the case fatality rate was close to about 10% which to my mind would may not be true because you have seen now more than 23000 odd patients and the cfr appears to be very very low so the confidence limits would also be varying that may be a aberrant observation per se when it comes to death when does it, when does the death occur it occurs in the second week of illness more often that is what is reported so far among the small numbers uh, which have died so at at uh, died so far second thing which we have to remember do they develop any kind of complication yes the usual complications like sepsis the bronchopneumonia these are also common among those who tend to land up into a complication but when it comes to death most often those who die die due to encephalitis that's another fact that we must remember now when it comes to diagnosis you have to do a pcr from on the secretions that are collected from the skin lesions you can use throat swab as well but that is not a good thing to use for diagnosis throat swab can be used for surveillance purposes because it is easy to collect uh, for diagnostic uh, for surveillance also when it comes to elisa based methods you have igg igm elisa which has been developed by cdc it's not commercially available as of now but uh, you know it can come positive on fifth day if it is igg and igm can come eight days after development of rash uh, respectively now this is perhaps a discrepancy because you know normally you would expect igm to be detected earlier compared to igg but since this is not a commercial elisa we don't know uh, what exactly uh, is the truth at this juncture when it comes to uh, ifa that is immunofluorescence can you do that a german company has developed orthopox virus igg and igm assay but since it is immunofluorescence assay uh, it's very tedious to tedious to do it's labor intensive uh, not many samples can be done very easily so pcr remains as the cornerstone for diagnosis per se now there are certain things which we have to understand this is a dna virus it has multiple sites over which perhaps we can use drugs as target now one of the targets that is that is that you will realize subsequently is also against dna replication where we use sidofavir as one of the drugs but we still don't know when it comes to um uh, other drugs we will try and see uh, subsequently now when, when it comes to tecovirimab <laughs> there are multiple statements that i need to make uh, in order to guard uh, 
from drawing uh, drawing inferences which which may or may not be correct no these are the drugs you know tecovirimat was one of those drugs which was developed against smallpox now there was a fear that a bioterrorism or an accidental uh, leakage from a lab may lead to reintroduction of this particular smallpox virus in the community and if it happens you, know, you don't have a immunized community because smallpox vaccination has been stopped so how do you stop this virus so this effort to develop new drug continued for some time and this tecovirimat it inhibits p37 protein which is one of the most conserved proteins so essentially it is likely to work against all ortho orthopox viruses you know whichever may come which, whether it is monkeypox whether it is cowpox whether it is smallpox what it does it, it does not allow envelope formation uh, after replication and that is why the virus particles become immature and then they will not be able to infect other uh, infect further the only robust data that we have in this uh, with these drugs is from the animal challenge studies obviously all of us know smallpox uh, was not there so you can't uh, you can't uh, do efficacy studies against smallpox so the only thing what they did was not smallpox based studies because you you cannot use smallpox virus this virus is only kept in two different laboratories which are under very heavy biosecurity and we are not uh, unlikely to use that particular uh, virus for even animal experiments what they did was they tried to use monkeypox virus in monkey in animal challenge studies because it also belongs to the pox family and therefore Uh, they tried to see whether tocovirimat tocovirimat can protect them but there are certain things which we must remember that these are only animal challenge studies we don't have good human data the route of administration is another issue because when it comes to animal challenge studies either they were providing monkeypox virus intravenously or intranasally and after 4 days the uh, the <laughs> the drugs were administered and the skin lesions were observed now this is not a natural route of uh, infection and naturally it would always have some implications in generalizing from that particular data they were given lethal dose uh, lethal dose was provided to the animal only one animal one placebo survived with that lethal dose however 95% of the animals that had received tecovirimat uh, survived after this particular administration of this drug now if you look at tecovirimat they tried to do a study because now <laughs> you have another set of a problem what should be the dose with which i should be using tecovirimat so eventually when they did uh, a trial with different dosages they zeroed down on certain dosages like you know uh, for uh, adults it is 600 mg twice a day normally you know it's a 200 mg tablet and it has to be given for 14 days however for children the dosages differ by the weight bands 13 to 24 years a 24 kg weight you would provide only 200 bd and 25 to 40 you would provide the dose as 400 bd and what is also important for us to uh, us to understand that there were very few uh, adverse events that were associated with tecovirimat now who should receive tecovirimat if you look at cdc guidelines you know they say those who have severe disease and how do you call uh, what is a severe disease those who have hemorrhagic disease confluent lesions sepsis encephalitis they must be provided with that. who are at risk of this severe disease those who are immunocompromised children who are less than 8 years old 8 uh, years of age then pregnant and breastfeeding women now that's something which we have to keep at the back of mind people with history of atopic dermatitis are also considered as good cases because they may progress a little more rapidly and what is also important is accidental implantation in eyes 
because essentially there is a fear that the sight uh, eyesight might, might be lost now what does tecovirumab do among those who have monkeypox infection if you look at the data that currently is available there is only one case series where seven patients were administered certain drugs you know against uh, uh, this monkeypox virus between 2018 to 21 in uk three of them received brinzidofovir and one had received tecovirumab we will see brinzidofovir uh, subsequently tecovirumab was found to reduce the duration of viral shedding and illness to about 10 days of hospitalization and nothing beyond that the second indirect effect that may come with such a uh, such an outcome is the person may not be more in- infectious for a longer period of time so you tend to control infection to some extent if it comes to uh, use of tecovirumab now if you actually see at uh, the other studies which have reported these numbers if you look at the european study that we referred to earlier uh, though they had 500 odd patients one of the things which we must remember that they had given tecovirumab only to eight patients so far and when it comes to sidofavir they had given it to 12 both of them come close to about 2% of the population and therefore what it means is we still don't have robust data to rely upon as to how uh, we should be using te- tecovirumab we do not know uh, uh, how effective it will be because human studies are lacking but when it comes to adverse events are the, those adverse events serious perhaps not so there are two different formulations with which it comes with oral tablets you know you have only minor kind of adverse events like headache nausea pain in abdomen and vomiting when it comes to iv injection perhaps it's all around the infusion site and the issues that are surrounding that which were not very ser- considered as very serious per se but these are some of the adverse events that have been observed so far now the big question comes most of us tend to feel would this drug tecovirumab would it be available to me we must remember that the company no longer produces this drug now they had produced drugs for putting these drugs in different stockpile of us which was maintained by barda and how many how many dosages that they have dosages is 600 mg by and 14 days 600 mg bd 14 days we can only treat about 17 lakh people with this uh, this particular drug and therefore it becomes a very difficult choice and even in us they are they were providing this particular drug on compassionate ground as as an off label use so there is very little hope that we will have access to this particular drug uh, unless the company puts it into patent pools and we try to uh, uh, produce it through generic uh, companies now if you look at brinzidofovir you know, when brinzidofovir is being talked of we have not heard about this compound but we must remember we have been using sidofovir especially against cme in hiv disease it is a pro drug of sidofovir the bioavailability issues continue to remain with uh, uh, this compound also and it tends to act against dna replication now what kind of benefits have been seen as i said the handicap for us is whatever data we have it comes from animal studies and when it was provided to prairie dogs they found that there is a modest survival benefit of 29% versus 14% that, that would be there with uh, placebo per se and uh, when we use this particular drug it's only a off label use that we need to keep at the back of mind and there is a transient reduction in the throat viral load that has been observed now whether this would be better than tecovirumab perhaps not we must remember that tecovirumab in whatever small numbers that has been seen has been found to be little better compared to this but if, if you look at those numbers we still cannot infer so easily now what should be the dose which we have to use of this brinzidofovir now you will find that 
His dose is also unclear. They have used 200 milligram once a week for three weeks based on company recommendation. While earlier they had used uh, a far lesser dose uh, of this particular compound. So the, there is complete lack of clarity, but there is still a hope that Sidofavir may be found useful uh, if further studies are done. Now, when it comes to the next issue is about pregnancy. Now, does it infect pregnant women? Is there some evidence? There have been four cases that have been reported in literature from Congo, where it was a pregnant woman who got infected. And among them, you find that two of them had miscarriage. One of the child uh, fetus actually died. It was a stillbirth. And one was a live birth where they found that the child also had uh, monkeypox after birth. So this is something which is which can still happen because we have to keep at the back of mind. So there is nothing so special that with respect to sexual intimacy, which may be so different between MSM and uh, heterosexual population, which perhaps, perhaps would differentiate so much that the cases tend to occur only among MSM population, currently in Europe and USA. Perhaps it's only a reflection of their sexual network. But these cases can, to my mind, we still don't have sufficient evidence that these cases can also occur among women, but they may be going unreported or they may be asymptomatic or if there are genital lesions, the women's health-seeking behavior may be reflecting on lower number of cases that have been found among uh, women. So the issue is we cannot say that it will not infect pregnant women. So we may have to keep uh, the vigil ongoing because that's a, that's a pregnancy is a stage of transient immunosuppression. Though only a few women have been reported to be infected, we need to be careful. Now, wh wh what will we ask to pregnant women? Some of the people have reported that history of travel outside country for last 21 days, to my mind, that's not a good criteria for us also. No, close contact with MPXV case, that's something which may be important for us to remember. And exposure to exotic cichlid because of those prairie dogs that we talked about and different squirrels uh, that people tend to keep as pets. Now, if this pregnant woman turns out to be positive, now, what is it that we are we are to do? 21 days of isolation at home, if she is being kept at home without visitors, you need to monitor clinically for fever and other uh, symptoms per se. You have to do sonography for fetal surveillance because uh, we have seen that there was a risk of uh, death that was observed in the fetus. And if she has severe disease, then you admit her, but you have to watch for preterm delivery. Tecovirmat, if available, one may use. Sidopovir perhaps cannot be used because it will depend on the gestational age because it is also a teratogenic drug. And the baby should be tested after birth for, against monkeypox virus. Now we come to the vaccines. Currently, there are two approved vaccines and a few in development. ACAM 2000 was one of those early vaccines that was approved. But this vaccine is based on replication competent virus. Now, which essentially means you cannot provide it to an immunocompromised host because it may replicate and cause uh, all kinds of issues, which we will see subsequently. There is Gynios, a vaccine that was developed in Denmark. It has a live attenuated modified vaccinia Ankara strain. Now, this particular strain has been passaged so often that even if it is live, neither does it have uh, any gene that can cause uh, virulence, nor uh, it is something which may cause any kind of damage once it enters in the body. So Gynios is the vaccine which is being zeroed down as of now. But there are certain issues like we talked about drugs. You know, we must remember with respect to vaccines as well. These vaccines were de being developed against smallpox. No? Now, we also know that when they were de developed against smallpox, the efficacy the data is unlikely to come back because it was smallpox. And even for monkeypox, 
there were so few cases that were occurring earlier so you don't have animal you don't have human data per se the only robust data that comes is from animal challenge studies but as we talked about earlier you know for this monkeypox virus was administered you know to these animals through intravenous intranasal and in one of the studies they did it intrathecally you know if you look at the endpoints you know the protection appears to be much better at this juncture but please remember here we don't talk of whether infection was prevented but here we talk about survival even in vaccines and we also need to remember that there are limited dosages of vaccine that are available as of now now gynios vaccine uh, if you look at the animal studies that they did in macaca fascicularis it's a monkey they gave two dosages of vaccine 28 days apart and compared it with administration of placebo and they challenged these monkeys with this particular virus having a lethal dose of this particular virus provided through different routes of administration after 63 days of administration of the first dose now across all the studies that have been done there were multiple small studies uh, that were done in animals uh, they found that 80 to 100% animals survived as a range whereas if you compare that with placebo arm it was 0 to 40% but one must remember that this data can also not be extrapolated so easily because there you are providing lethal dose to the animal and trying to see whether the animal was surviving you know that situation may be far different in human settings when it comes to gynios vaccine you know how is it administered you have to give two dosages 0.5 ml four weeks apart and the immune response tends to mount sometime around two weeks after the second dose there have been so far 22 studies have been done over about 8000 odd individuals between 18 to 80 years who have received at least one dose of gynios vaccine now this vaccine for adverse events they try to see whether the vaccine produces a different adverse event profile among those who had received smallpox vaccine and among those who had not received smallpox but most of the adverse events that have been reported with gynios are minor no major sae has been reported only 0.8% had tachycardia and tropti test came out positive but that proportion was smaller uh, and was not considered as significant animal studies also do not reveal any adverse event related to fetal malformation because this is all data that we have to take is now from animal studies because of absence of human study <laughs> however there were small studies uh, that were done with respect to immunogenicity data like we used to see in covid the first approvals that came from uh, our own uh, regulator they were based on immunogenicity data that the vaccine produces sufficient immune protection and that was studied through prnts now when you do such comparisons the gynios and compare it with acam what did they find that uh, pre vaccination levels were almost similar in uh, gynios as well as acam and they need to be measured because then you can compare it easily but when it comes to post vaccination you find gynios was superior to acam 2000 vaccine in terms of prnt values uh, that were observed now let's try and learn a little bit about acam 2000 now this is a intradermal vaccine uh, all of us are older so we remember the smallpox vaccine it was uh, it is a uh, scarification uh, is done there you have a bipronged uh, needle and then what you do is you prick it 15 times and this is a single dose that vaccine that has to be given and it has to be repeated after 3 years however if you actually look at the data that came out of clinical trial and subsequently the regulator had also got to issue a black box warning that it can cause myocarditis pericarditis uh, in almost up to 30 13% people people can also develop 
encephalitis, progressive vaccinia, blindness, fetal death, and uh, Steven Johnson syndrome. It is best to be avoided among immunocompromised persons. Now, this is the data that you see with respect to severe adverse events that occur. These serious adverse events are of a very wide range and they can be potentially uh, creating major morbidity issues or even mortality is also possible among them. So this is one vaccine uh, which perhaps may not um, remain as a standard for providing this subsequently. Some agencies like CDC, they recommend vaccines. No? Now, what do these vaccines do? They reduce viral shedding, that is duration for which an individual may be shedding virus, and the complications that can arise out of this monkeypox infection. One of the recommendations is for post-exposure prophylaxis. But one of some of us may even wonder that if I provide post-exposure prophylaxis, will that protection come in time? And if I have to provide this particular vaccine at the time of onset of fever, because I can't diagnose it earlier. So the question remains moot, but CDC continues to recommend. Now, where do they recommend that? Wherever there is a high-risk exposure. And what do we mean by high-risk exposure? Direct contact with infected body fluids, whenever it occurs and has been reported, perhaps you may provide this particular vaccine. It could also be provided according to them for people with intermediate risk. And what is intermediate risk? Three hours of unprotected, without mask, exposure with infected person. Do I think that this could be a... Uh, this could be uh, scientifically very valid, to my mind, no. For an illness which doesn't spread as rapidly within the family, to expect that three hours unprotected exposure can lead to uh, a significant exposure and therefore provision of vaccine is mandated, perhaps may not be true. I think that is a scare that is leading to such a kind of an approach of an additional indication which, to my mind, requires more caution in interpretation. A person who receives the vaccine should also be isolated because this is a post-exposure vaccine and you have to watch this person for the next three weeks to see whether uh, infection tends to come. Should we administer targeted pre-exposure vaccine? So which are the target groups where it can be administered? Healthcare workers and lab personnel, especially lab personnel, who perhaps may be exposed to this infection more. But to my mind, what is most important? We should have good infection control practices, adhere to them while handling such cases where sores or biological fluids exposure is likely to occur. To my mind, with the numbers that we have declared that we have, the likelihood that this infection can be controlled if we adopt the right kind of public health measures, Vaccine may not be required at this stage of the outbreak, but the caution could be we have to strengthen the standard infection control practices that we are used to when we talk about HIV. Uh, we, were, we were always learning about standard, uh, standard precautions. What about giving it to MSM population alone? We must remember that though it is spreading in Europe only among MSM, it doesn't mean that it does not spread among them. So we don't have that kind of a robust data. It is only that the infection has entered into a particular kind of a sexual network, and therefore it is occurring among MSM. Now we need to we need to have evidence whether this is an STI. The one thing which we must remember that this virus has been found to be present in seminal fluid, almost. Uh, 100% of the samples, close to about 90, 90 odd percent. But there is still no data to suggest that this is a replication competent virus. People will have to culture this virus from the semen and try to see whether it can replicate. If it replicates, then it becomes STI. Otherwise, it cannot become an STI asset. So stigmatizing a population like MSM, you will find that the community may not come forward and tell you that they have these lesions. And that could lead to silent spread of disinfection across. 
and why should we worry about such a silent spread because normally we assume that 3% of the males you know they are likely to be belonging to msm population where they would only have a partner which is male however the proportion of bisexual males is almost three to three folds higher and therefore if a silent spread starts you will find that the mainstream population will also get uh, this infection so identification of a case uh, whenever it occurs you no know, if we focus only on msm population would also mean that there is indirect exposure of sexual identity and that will drive these uh, msm populations underground and that's not something what we want to have now what what should be our priorities in the country one of the things which we have to remember is even if if i focus on hrg population the right side graph if you just see if i focus on isolating 65% of the infections with rash symptoms among high risk population if i can pick up pick them up the numbers would continue to remain small at its worst it may become endemic but it is unlikely to spill over into mainstream population now if you if you even look at contact tracing that you do if you do a strong contact tracing while you know you are isolating 65% of the infected cases with rash you will find that the right side red one that you are seeing you know you will find that the numbers will still remain so small that it is unlikely to spill over into the population and cause a major outbreak but we also have more diffuse challenge so far the cases and cleared that we have do not suggest predominance of a particular vulnerable group like msm we need to mobilize contact tracing as we did in covid because we do not know how it will spread in india because it's not restricted to only one group of population to be focused on now we come to our practical issues that we are likely to face now when it comes to handling monkey pox patients in hospitals what what are the precautions that one may one may be advised to now, there should be strict adherence to standard precautions use of ppe is advantageous for people keep the patient in a single room with dedicated toilet preferably if the room is shared both the patients if they have monkey pox virus or some other one doesn't have they must wear mask and have a curtain separating them which i think is a very excessive kind of thing that respiratory mode is the common mode but i uh, i would still doubt that these kinds of guidelines may not uh, remain the same over a period of time only you, you, when it comes to cleaning the room only wet mopping should be done uh, so that you do not generate a mist uh, generate air uh, which would be contaminated with this virus special air handling is not required and there has to be appropriate bio waste management which we did even in hiv so this, there is nothing new and we need to be little more careful when it comes to bio waste that comes from monkey pox uh, patient if you are handling patients at home if somebody is doing that they need to cover the skin lesions so that the likelihood that you come in contact with the source per se is reduced there should be a good hand hygiene which would not be difficult to follow even the fact that covid has uh, already improved that part barrier nursing has to be adopted we need to isolate the patient and there could be issues around toilet and bathroom we really don't know how we can resolve them in a country like ours so perhaps their isolation is also going to become important but we also need to keep at the back of mind that uh, uh, even in hospital settings to have so many rooms with separate toilets is likely to pose a challenge if this increases in conclusion monkey pox is an endemic infection and is now posing a challenge globally it's an evolving science so we don't understand much about this infection we we'll learn over a period of time india has cleared two and currently at least few cases have been reported so far if we sensitize community and involve them in detecting cases and contacts we will be able to control its spread in india 
thank you for patient uh, listening thank you thank you very much ganga sir it was a very enlightened session uh, and uh, i think uh, sir has made the points very clear so i will uh, before i can i mean i just summarize uh, this uh, i will uh, ask our panelist or chairs for any comments so dr grover sir is grover sir around i think uh, uh, he has given such a wonderful uh, uh, details of uh, uh, the available details of monkey pox <laughs> as because we are still uh, learning about it and maybe you know in the times to come in the next couple of uh, month, uh, weeks or months things will be unfolding because every day we in the newspaper we find that the number of cases is slowly rising and the government is also taking steps uh, as to you know how to contain the disease and probably all those things which you have you have told us uh, there are still a lot of uh, you know areas where more and more information will be required and particularly uh, those uh, people where they uh, are not uh, not let's say confiding or not telling that they have been like one case which came from the middle east and he was uh, detected positive and he landed up in india so there are uh, issues like that also because i think that stigma issue is a big thing and uh, i would be wondering that uh, regarding this smallpox issue like uh, they said uh, they say that the smallpox uh, vaccination which uh, many of us uh, have uh, with us so how is it going to be protective and uh, uh, is the uh, you know immunity provided by smallpox is also waning over time so what is going to be you know uh, uh, this role play sir uh, the data that is available for smallpox vaccine it tends it tends to show that after 2 years the neutralizing antibody titer tends to start coming down so 2 years after vaccination of smallpox but that doesn't mean the t cell sensitization may still not work so one of the things that may happen for us is those who have received smallpox vaccine have two advantages first advantage that would be there is it will not prevent infection but the complications will be lesser uh, uh, the uh, shading viral shading will be lesser because the immune response can still be mounted by the body over a period of time since this is this is a the duration of this particular illness is little longer and the second advantage that we might have uh, is as you looked at gynios vaccine it is a two dose vaccine those who have received smallpox vaccine may perhaps require only one dose of vaccine instead of two dosages of vaccine but the data is yet to emerge <laughs> this will continue <laughs> for some time yes, yes. we will be groping in dark <laughs> definitely sir definitely <laughs> over to you dr ruby to take it further oh, thank you thank you dr grover sir uh, i think uh, sir has made very clear point about that and there was a question also in the chat box uh, regarding the same which uh, dr grover has already asked about the smallpox vaccine uh, so i will just move next on to dr uh, sk gupta sir sir it was a wonderful talk uh... listening to you as always i was trying to jot down some questions but uh, the moment i finished writing you had already answered it <laughs> but one <laughs> thank you but one question remains and the covid as we know that uh, the measles uh, one it occurs in number of children it leads to number of infections has covid uh, done something to the immunity of certain group of people or say the population in general that these infections are now becoming prominent though they the, the population the msm population must be indulging same sort of behavior over the period of time but what has happened post covid that these infections have started surfacing now and not only this infection but also the polio started being detected in the mozambique and usa and so many other places sir that first i come to polio 
that polio virus is vaccine derived polio virus no it is still not uh, the wild type uh, polio that we should be worried now with respect to covid uh, currently it is very difficult to say what is the long term impact no in terms on the immune system per se so whatever we understand so far uh, repeated infections are becoming common there is no no issue with about it but to come out with robust evidences we are unable to do that because both the things have happened most of the people have acquired covid and most of the people have also been immunized per se so do to do any kind of a study and come out with a uh, with an evidence becomes as much challenging per se but what i would i would definitely feel that the linkage with covid may not be responsible for this as we said for europe and us if the pattern has been consistently msm pattern now it would essentially mean that it was introduction of this infection in the sexual network of that particular population so we still keep our fingers crossed perhaps this is just a zoonotic infection that has come and in any case if we were we had stopped smallpox vaccination one or the other kind of pox virus would have had invaded us now one worry was cowpox virus instead what has come is monkeypox virus thank you sir so thank you sir thank you uh, i think uh, dr pankaj your okay. comment or any <clears throat> Yeah, I think it's wonderful. Always wonderful to have Dr. Raman Gangakar on our forum, and we have done uh, I think few talks on COVID, and uh, he uh, used to make things very clear, you know, very crisp and clear. But I think it's not uh, true with this pox virus. I think <laughs> the things are not actually crisp and clear, right? And we are just you know, this is a learning science, and actually we are uh, there. So my two comments on that. Firstly, definitely we need to uh, you know, differential. Uh, uh, we have to have a very strong. Very clear, different diagnosis because sometimes patient may come with you know painful lymph nodes, some some sort of rash here and there, and sometimes we jumped into the conclusion, okay, this is monkey pox go. So uh, every you know lymph uh, lymph nodes or every you know rash may not be a monkey pox, right? We have to have uh, a good different diagnosis and it's a clear because the one patient came to me uh, a, a week back, she had some lymph nodes, painful nodes, some rashes all over face and all that, and patient used to travel, you know, she's a teacher traveling to you know uh, Hapur. So you know, uh, sometimes you feel okay, symptoms are same, and uh, and the, the issue is that the testing is not readily available, right? You have to you know send to you know uh, some government hospital or some Delhi government hospital, and there the you know uh, regions would be taken for this PCR testing. So the challenge I think is challenge for us, right? Because uh, many patients would come to physicians clinic, uh, same sort of symptoms. So we have to uh, very keen. Now. Uh, Three people in Kerala actually had, you know, they, they have a travel history, okay. And one, I think, died at 22 years without comorbidities. That died. So uh, I don't know what is the cause of death, possibly because of pneumonia or something like that. I don't have the details. But in few patients, Delhi, you know, they don't have any travel history, right? So is monkeypox is in our community now, right? This is a very strong, you know, question that comes in everybody's mind that for clinicians that uh, patient comes with this uh, classical symptoms, isn't it the community? And what we are going, what the challenge for physicians who are you know sleeping cleanly, you know the mask is on, mask is all off, you know people are not uh, wearing mask and all that. And in fact, uh, you know people feel that COVID is over, but uh, you know this fourth wave is on, and we are seeing a lot of a little surge of COVID patients, right? So COVID is going on fourth wave, uh, monkeypox is their community. So what is what is the future of this you know particular epidemic that is that is going on, sir? Sir, your That's a very important comment, question. Sir. Yeah. <laughs> the future is you know for last so many centuries we are organisms and human beings have been have been fighting for survival uh, we we managed to develop you know good uh, medicines good vaccines so the day would not be very far you know, though uh, sometimes i wonder when i say within next two years pan corona vaccine will come so all corona viruses would be gone but uh, there are times when i think would a commercial company uh, would they like to produce a pan corona virus vaccine 
over <laughs> the current vaccines we don't know <laughs> but we still need to remain hopeful the same thing <clears throat> perhaps will occur now uh, if you actually look at zinias no if monkeypox becomes a life threatening illness then in those cases provision of a vaccine that could protect you against all pox viruses like this zinias would become the only tool that would be available to us but uh, we should still wait before we panic or get alarm about the situation things still you know, there is a room to think thing may emerge little differently because you know today even if we have 22000 odd uh, people who have been infected the scare continues to be high in europe and us because even they have animals as reservoirs which could which could make that as endemic uh, disease so the scare that side is very high and you have a significant msm population that exists there so we still don't know whether it is an sti i mean in india if we are looking at clade 2 you know, which is not uh, the european clade uh, i might be speculating and i might just say that it was endemic here Uh, it was present but was not detected no it used to happen because basically this is a self limiting illness for those who survive <laughs> the even the skin lesions tend to go so we do not know as of now no this strain has the strain is not european strain it is a newly evolved otherwise you know it should not it should have been a different story yes Uh, yeah. i wish to add that uh, just because the, because the virus is not being transmitted through the respiratory route we already have a drug we already have a vaccine so this scenario uh, in transforming to the covid like situation is pretty low and we 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 can always be hopeful as professor ganga hitra said probably we are much cautious about it so probably we are pick up picking up uh, these cases much more and maybe that they were there earlier in the uh, society but one thing which i am not able to uh, like uh, somehow um, um, understand that how come the women are not being uh, reported they are not being like uh, as sir say that they are there in the population and it is pretty unlikely that we have people, women with hiv we have so many other but so many studies more than uh, 28000 cases all over and no women or maybe few women yeah that i think is a reflection of predominance of this infection in the sexual network because majority of these these msm population if they are they are only going to have sex with men you know the likelihood of sexual intimacy leading to fluid exposure biological fluid exposure becomes lesser for women second thing which i feel is in women if it is going to going to occur because of sexual fluids uh, transfers you might find that these lesions continue to remain hidden no uh, and since their health seeking behavior social empowerment is low they may not go to the hospital and try to find out what should be what should i do if they delay the decision to go to the hospital for about 2 to 3 weeks by then the lesions are gone so she is more than happy i do not believe that sexual intimacy would be so different between msm and heterosexual population that the risk of exposure could be very high unless there is an evidence that this is a sexually transmitted infection here in penogenital uh, sex you know pino anal sex perhaps would have a higher transmission efficiency i would not be willing to say that women may not get infected maybe they are asymptomatic maybe they are not reporting but it will occur if it can occur among children <laughs> why why women will be spared <laughs> i can't understand yes children might be abused uh, no 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 that is on the face hands no most of that is because of puchmi
Dr. Vanshal wants to know something. Okay, so I think uh, Dr. Paras, uh, Paras has a question also in the chat box, but uh, I will like if Dr. Paras, you can just ask and... Uh, yeah, Paras, are you, Gangashal, uh, thanks for the wonderful session. Uh, it was a very enlightening talk as always. Hello, ma'am. Uh, what I have not been able to understand till now is that what is the exact root of transmission and then which body fluid is it saliva, is it the scab crust? Or is it the pustule fluid apart from the seminal fluid? I mean, how is it getting exactly transmitted? Which fluid? And then it, what is the entry point? What are the cells that take it up? I mean, how, how is it going actually? So as we said, <coughs> the viral load continues to be high when it comes to the skin lesions you know, compared to pharyngeal lesions, which perhaps increases more when it, if you take the swab from persons who have genital lesions and those who have proctitis. Unfortunately, I did not present that particular data. So those fluids are far more important, but nobody has been able to calculate the transmission efficiency. That is something which we have to keep at the back of mind. It's, perhaps this will require some time because you need to have a large cohort and the number of cases occurring locally at one place are smaller and therefore there are challenging issues in terms of conduct of research also because you have only a few sporadic cases that occur in different places. So how do you arrive at uh, different information? Now with respect to uh, you said the exposure which, which body fluids, sir? Which body? And can it get through saliva no, into no, no. your respiratory secretion? Can it get through your scab particles, which have scab particulate is... matter? You can inhale it, or does it go from skin lesion to rubbing your skin, or is yeah. it your genital lesions and you get uh, <laughs> the MSM kind of uh, sexual exposure, which is causing it? That's what I want to learn because for me as a clinician, if somebody is coming with those lesions, if somebody is coming with those lesions, uh, can I get it through his respiratory secretions, his coughing, or would I get it when I touch him at his pustules, or can those scabs which are scaling now be in the air in my clinic and I can inhale it later on also? So the, this is what I exactly I want to find out for us. No, uh, it is more to do with the source where you would have bodily secretions there in the rashes. You may not worry as much about, uh, this is my take, that you should not worry about uh, respiratory secretions as much because in any case, if it is respiratory secretions or it is scab being dried and you inhale that particular scab uh, containing the virus, one must remember that these individuals tend to stay in the same family where there may be having four or five you know, other family members there. Does everybody get infection? We still don't have any data. We say that secondary attack rate is only 9%. 9% is too small to explain for a respiratory you know, transmission that can occur in a household. So to me, that is not an issue. And barrier nursing is the best answer whenever you see a patient. That's the best thing to do. So, uh, as a corollary to that, so when does the person become infective? Is it when the skin lesions have appeared, or is it he has a prodrome and then he can infect people? Because, to my understanding, whatever literature I surgeon, uh, it's only when the person gets the skin lesion he becomes infective. So, so that means it shows on his face that he can infect others. So that's helpful. That's, that's, that's right. Important. That so All far right. what we understand is patient may develop fever first and rash may follow. Some patients don't develop fever, but rash may still be there as the first manifestation. But whenever the first manifestation occurs, the risk increases. Of so it's not that if somebody is having fever, can he transmit? Or is it only when he has rash, only then he can transmit? It would be rash, obviously rash, no? All right. Because bodily okay. bodily fluid. So that's has to... that's very helpful. That means if somebody is not showing it on the face, 
he cannot be transmitting you so you no, can no, stay assured no. so that's no. great thank you but uh, paras i i understand that it is not the face it is the genital regions which are much more important and oh, patient both. might be hiding may not be <laughs> no it is it is actually more centrifugal actually by uh, the distribution of the rash what whatever literature i search personally so all right genital is something you will transmit more genitally uh, so for the clinician standpoint of view in the clinics or in the wards that's what i'm asking that if somebody without rash cannot transmit that means we are pretty safe to work can i come in okay yeah, yeah. dr dr rajiv bansal yes sir yeah yeah uh, thank you dr raman i think uh, we are really honored and fortunate to have you know such a wonderful speaker about monkeypox i have a very practical question suppose we have a suspected case of monkeypox with rash with fever with lymphadenopathy so what should as a physician do number 1 2 3 4 where do we get the test done to confirm it what drugs to start uh, in the you know uh, opd setting or ipd setting sir as i said there are no drugs as of yeah. now yes uh, the only possible drug could have had been cidofovir but uh, there is hardly any data on cidofovir so uh, it's is not it worth it is it available uh, cidofovir is available now second thing which is important to remember is uh, where should you be testing i may not be a good person to say that but in delhi i suppose uh, aims no? we have a virus research diagnostic lab aims will definitely test there but the samples have to be sent there and uh, because i think it is it is one of the names in 15 virus research diagnostic labs which are approved for testing so aim should be one of the sites but i think ruby can <laughs> check and tell or i will inform yeah. her tomorrow uh, sir actually i have uh, i have searched on the icmr icmr site is uh, showing the all the samples should be sent to the icmr and then they are going to the pune niv so for the confirmation of the uh, first they are just checking with the orthopox virus then they are doing with the uh, i mean isolate if it is positive then they are isolating with the monkey pox so no, can we send the but i have to search for the aim also uh, icmr does not have any storage place there uh, yeah icmr headquarter so she must be referring it to, to the aims. dr lalit dar no, in aims i will he i will check with him it must Although be that is a very 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 practical question because it is a practical problem suppose a patient comes and he wants to confirm the diagnosis so where do we send the sample or we send the patient there sir that so, list list was list of 15 vrdls uh was uh, i think last it's a day or two <laughs> when they decided on this we will find out and i will inform dr ruby i think it has to be aims there is there is no other place because they are we are in our own lab isolation so, ward has been made at the lngp hospital and uh, they are increasing the isolation ward further because today only i read the newspaper uh, but uh, definitely we will uh, confirm it uh, and uh, i will update dr bansal so it uh, is a uh, government document referred to lngp hospital no they cannot do in lngp that i can tell you testing has to be done in aims all right thank you sir thank you so much so anybody has any comment or should i shall i summarize and uh, we should uh, close i think I, shall so shall i summarize yeah. some points yeah please go no, so yeah. before before the, that before that one more coach uh, which is very some actually would these skin lesions of the uh pustules they will finally uh, disappear altogether uh, leaving yes. the clean skin or would they leave yes. the scar yes yes they do that's the only difference between smallpox skin lesions and uh, monkey pox <clears throat> so practically no scar would be left it's no only scar. disfigurement for maybe one and a half month or two months that's all that we are looking at but, but the risk of death also because it's uh, not only right. the kerala has reported like that but uh, in spain they have recently reported two deaths one of the male was some 31 years old 
33 years okay. and 41 years with no chronic morbidity. Oh. <laughs> Cause was some myocarditis or what? No, they, they didn't tell that. Okay. But All it right. was, they could not identify any significant thing. So young death is also did. possible. Hmm? We don't know. Most of them end up into encephalitis. We don't know. Sir, do we have any uh, predilection of a type of lymphadenopathy, the site of the lymphadenopathy or the... Uh, or... No, initially it is local, then it becomes generalized. So I think it was a very uh, wonderful talk and definitely, I mean, it's an emerging disease. So we will be having the new things every day. And uh, <laughs> so... So we have to wait for that uh, and I think uh, we need to update. But uh, from the today's talk, just uh, I think uh, sir has made very clear point. The transmission is uh, maybe transit through the bush meat, uh, which is still, uh, we don't know. Uh, and uh, mainly the population is uh, man having sex with men are at the high risk and they are spreading the disease. Uh, ma maximum cases in the Europe is uh, from uh, uh, these. And sir has made this uh, pear dog. Uh, pear dog may, does not mean it is a dog, basically because uh, they just uh, bark like the dog, but they are rodents. Yes, sir. So I think uh, this is the they are the rodents. Uh, so Dr. Paras also has made this very clear to me. This they are, they are the rodents uh, and not the dog. But uh, name has been given because they bark like the dog. Uh, so and uh, uh, I mean uh, squirrel are the reservoir as of now, which is presumed to be there and uh, viral load high in uh, mainly the uh, basically the skin lesions especially if they are in the genitalia so there the viral load is high and uh, skin lesions we, which have the fluids so viral load is uh, high there so transmission mostly uh, will be through the skin lesions although on the icmr website i have seen uh, uh, icm site uh, this is the transmission is two day from uh, two day after the fever I mean, before the skin lesion starts, until uh, can be for the one week till the lesions uh, totally go away. And uh, drugs, definitely we don't have the any drug as of now, but maybe if the cases will rise, so they will arrive. Vaccines uh, is still, many vaccines are in the pipeline or in the trial phase, but we don't know whether uh, which vaccines are has made very clear about the vaccines. And... Uh, I think the drugs also only the uh, only one drug Victoria will, uh, is available, but it is not very much. Uh, we don't know whether only the main, main treatment is symptomatic isolation, mainly isolation and the symptomatic treatment, and special precautions with the pregnant ladies. Yes, I think uh, uh, is it clear? Any our panelists or sir, any comments, or I will hand over the mic to the organizers to the EDPA. If no comments, so Dr. Jami or Dr. Paras or Dr. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you Dr. Rupi for thank the you. briefing. Yeah. So I, on the behalf of a scientific committee of PDPA, want to thanks Dr. Thank Dr. Raman sir for providing such a comprehensive and enlightening session on monkeypox. I think we learned a lot today. Uh, basically, I knew very little about monkeypox before today. And uh, I thank Dr. Ruby for moderating the session very well and also providing the take-home messages from this session at the end of the session. Also, I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Ashok Grover, Dr. Pankaj and Dr. S.K. Gupta for chairing the session and providing their uh, valuable inputs. I hope uh, we continue to have many more enlightening sessions like this. And uh, maybe as the disease evolves, uh, we'll have more sessions to learn more and more about monkeypox. Yeah, sir, I think, uh, sir, uh, sir is, uh, I mean, kind enough uh, and very noble person. So, and very humble. So, anytime uh, we request him, uh, I mean, sir, sir, don't know the word no, actually. So, he never says no. So, thank you very much, sir, for uh, your, this uh, kindness, this humble, and uh, I think uh, this EDP forum, uh, will request you further uh, for uh, such enlightened talk. Uh, so, Dr. Paras, will you? I think I think we all feel privileged to have him with us, and he has blessed us on many number of occasions. 
with his uh, great scientific knowledge. And uh, I know the science is always evolving. So we'll have updates regularly coming up from Dr. Ganga, sir. And we again thank you all for being with us. Uh, if Dr. Grover, Rajiv, or Dr. SK, sir, or Pankaj has to make any remarks, uh, we can go with that or we take it towards conclusion. Final I thing, which I. Sorry. Yes, yes, can you we, we might have some issues in the times to come when the February comes and the chicken pox arrives. And uh, by, by that time, I hope we, we have more knowledge and more understanding and we'll not be confused <laughs> as the goal is gone and we have more updates. Thank you very much. I think it, we had a wonderful evening. Uh, we, I think, gained a lot of information on this upcoming disease. And probably all this information is going to help us in you know, getting up as to what we are going to face in times to come. And I, I think it's time to close this session and thank Dr. Raman once again uh, for such a wonderful uh, scientific session. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you sir. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you, Clarinet, for hosting us here. We feel privileged yeah. to partner with you. Thank you so much, sir, uh, everyone, for joining this uh, session and making this session uh, wonderful. It was very glad to have you on our platform, Clarinet. Thank you so much. Thank you, dear. Good to be we'll associate more. Yeah. And good night. Have a... Thank you, everybody. Thank you.